Okay, so hi guys, thanks for joining on a Saturday morning. Um, my name is Mike George. I'm a fifth year intercalating medical student. I did my finals last year um, and obviously a student at the University of Liverpool. Um, welcome to today's session. It's going to be centered around diabetes and the kind of core knowledge that I think you need for finals. Um, obviously diabetes is a big topic, so I've honed down on those sort of exam favorites. Hopefully I won't take too much of your time on this sunny morning anyway. So diabetes in general is a vast topic and there are numerous types as I'm sure you're aware. And this is a key kind of point to figuring out what you need to decide you think is relevant for exams and not. I have my own opinions. Um, today we're going to focus on type 1, type 2, which are probably the two most core types of diabetes. Within my kind of, in my head, I cl classify it as a sort of antenatal or women's health topic. You need to think about gestational diabetes, which is effectively hyperglycemia in pregnancy, um, often presents later in the pregnancy, and it's actually a risk factor for later developing type two diabetes. Um, you also have MODI, which is maturity onset diabetes of the young, which is effectively like a type presenting in younger people which is autoimmune diabetes of adulthood and that's effectively a form of slow burning type 1 diabetes in adults and then finally you have steroid induced which is quite self-explanatory there are a few other types to be aware of or that you will find as you kind of look up diabetes however i think these are the most important and if i had to pick three i'd go with the top three in the list to have a good idea of so we'll start with the case. So you have a four-year-old uh, little girl who presents to her GP with weight loss and fatigue. She's got a one-month history of increasing fatigue associated with weight loss. Um, she was healthy at birth with uncomplicated vaginal delivery, up to date with her immunizations. She eats well, but she's always thirsty. She has no concerns regarding development or social um, development either. She's got a recent history of nocturnal enuresis, so bedwetting effectively um, with no medications, no allergies, no family histories. And she lives at home with her family, goes to nursery half the day, and she drinks a lot of water and juice at the moment or of relate. So which of the following types of diabetes that I've just mentioned, do you think this sounds most like? So I'm just going to pull up a poll for you. The poll's anonymous, so have a have a whack at it and we'll see we'll see how it goes. Great. So bang on. Ev everyone got it right. It's not a particularly um strenuous question, but it's really important actually to be able to have a really clear idea of what you're looking at. So type 1 diabetes, when you have a young person and in a diabetes talk, sure, type 1 is the most common answer. But it's worth being aware of some of those signs. So they were thirsty, they were bedwetting, they would lost weight. Um, and some of those are actually quite worrying signs in a child as well. So the GP agrees with you guys and suspects a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Mm -hmm. Which is the following, which of the following is the most appropriate in initial investigation, i.e., ASAP. So I'll run another poll. Let me let me know what you think. Excuse me, looking over to one side, by the way, I've got you, your guys' chat and, uh, and polls on, on the left of me anyway. Okay, so everyone's gone for C, which is random blood uh, glucose. So this is a little bit of a loaded question. It's a bit of a tricky question. C is absolutely appropriate. However, the answer I'm looking for today is A, and I'll explain by reasoning. So C is fantastic in terms of 
if you guys are thinking about diagnosing this patient on the spot um, and being very definitive about it. However, taking blood off this little girl might not be that easy. And in terms of a patient with uh, symptoms, although blood glucose is helpful, it's not necessary. And the first thing to do, and the most appropriate initial investigation would be a urine dipstick. Now, the reason for that is a lot of these patients present with ketosis. So type 1 diabetics often present with an element of kind of DKA effectively. Um, and it's worth being aware that this little girl's lost weight. She's feeling unwell. And so if you dipped her urine, you might well find that um, she has ketones and glucose. And any time you have a child with ketones and glucose, you're going to send them for assessment in the hospital. So the blood glucose, although it's helpful to look at their hyperglycemia, it won't check for ketosis. Um, so I think, especially in a GP setting, if you dip their urine and you have those two features, you then send them in and they probably have a whole host of investigations after that. I hope that makes sense. So that brings us to type 1 diabetes then. So in summary, type 1 is an autoimmune condition where you have destruction of the pancreatic beta cells secondary to T cell mediated response. And the result of that is uh, an insulin deficiency and an inability to then um, store your glucose correctly. So it's a pretty common uh, disease and it accounts for almost 95% of childhood diabetes. So as I said, when you have a child with features of diabetes, your brain should be kind of wandering over to type one and it affects one in 450 children in the UK. So it's very common. The presentation can be in two peaks, typically around age five, as this little girl was, and then also uh, those at puberty. And it can be asymptomatic, or you can feature the polyuria, polydipsia, um, so that's excessive weeing and drinking, um, fatigue, weight loss, uh, enuresis, and then kind of urogenital um, infections as well, classically can present. Obviously, in a child with a urogenital condition, you need to be aware of other causes, for example, safeguarding causes as well, but that's the kind of worms that we won't go into today. So when you're diagnosing these patients, you can use a whole host of tests, fasting glucose and blood glucose, um, a two hour oral glucose tolerance test, which in practice isn't used very much, but for as a helpful reminder, just remember it's the same threshold as a random test. And then your HbA1c of over 48 as well. Uh, sorry, over and including 48. Um, from my experience, sometimes I've been told that we don't use HbA1c in children. However, when I've done all the reading and in other settings, people do agree with it. So um, don't rule it out effectively. So how do we manage patients with type 1 diabetes? Well, you need to educate them on the condition. You need to provide dietary um you need to provide dietary uh, advice and then offer lifelong insulin therapy as well. So moving on then, a new case. We have a six-year-old boy who's brought into a &E by his worried mother. He's drowsy, difficult to rouse, and he, the mother reports that he's been feeling unwell in the days before with a fever and a, a slight cough. Today he's clutching at his abdomen, he's vomited five times, but he's usually fit and well. On examination, he's got dry mucous membrane, skin turgor, um, reduced skin turgor, diffuse abdominal pain, and heavy laborious breathing. What, which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Fantastic. Okay, so the majority have gone for diabetic ketoacidosis. And uh, we also have one or two going for sepsis. So both those answers are really good. Uh, and I'm quite glad that they're the choices you came to. So granted, we're in a diabetes talk. And so DK is probably the obvious one. I've tried to pop in a few really common signs into this case that should point you in the direction of DKA. Um, and I'll highlight those 
in a second. The answer is DKA. The reason I'm happy that someone said sepsis is because fundamentally, if you have a, a child who's feverish and not looking themselves, you really need to be careful. Um, you need to make sure they're not septic. And um, the fact he's in A&E, he'd almost certainly have um, numerous investigations to check for an onboard infection. Now, the reason it's DKA, this boy is six years old and we know that type one diabetes can present in young children and more so, you might not see any features of type 1 diabetes until they present with um, DKA, as I mentioned in case one, hence why that urinalysis uh, was so important. DKA is often triggered by a, an illness in the preceding days, and the fever and the cough, um, although it can point towards a respiratory infection, and for example, a septi sepsis or a case of pneumonia, the fact that he's clutching at his abdomen today and he's vomiting on separate occasions would be difficult to justify if he only had um, a respiratory infection. When you look at his examination findings, the first two are evidence of dehydration, which is very common. So these patients are often dehydrated. Um, and then the abdominal pain, especially vague abdominal pain in a child, you need to think about DKA. I'm not sure if any of you will um, know it. In fact, I'm sure you will. But heavy laborious breathing is a nod to a clinical sign that uh, is epo eponymous, and that's Kussmaul's uh, breathing. So heavy laborious breathing or hyperventilation is also seen. So DKA is a life-threatening complication of type 1 diabetes, underpinned by insufficient insulin levels meaning even though you've got plenty of glucose in your system, you can't use it properly. And so the body switches to its energy source to um, fatty acids, and that produces ketone bodies. So risk factors or predisposing factors include infection, missed insulin doses, poor control of blood glucose levels, stress, and then alcohol and drug use in your sort of teenagers would probably be more common than in the younger children. So as I said, it can precede a diagnosis of type, type 1 diabetes, although it's effectively a complication or an association. It can present with polyuria, polydipsia and dehydration. You can have nausea, vomiting and abdo pain. And then you also need to be aware of your altered consciousness, um, altered mental state, difficult to rouse. One other really clear clinical sign is pear drops breath. So that's the smell of ketones on the breath. And it effectively is a sweet, kind of pear drop sweet smelling um, sign. So diagnosis is a triad. So I always found it really logical because you think of the terms diabetic, keto and acidosis. And if you can remember those things, you'll remember the diagnostic criteria. So diabetic means to have high blood, level, blood, high blood glucose levels. So that's over 11.1. Ketones, so either in the blood of greater than three, or if you dip someone's urine and you find three plus ketones. And then acidosis is a pH of less than 7.3 or a bicarbonate of less than 15. So you've diagnosed diabetic ketoacidosis. You then need to think about how you're going to treat it. Anytime you have an unwell patient, don't be afraid to start with an A2E. Uh, in fact, you probably would be re encouraged to start with an A2E. So if you're in an OSCE in particular, that's a good, good place to start. So you need to assess this patient for risks to their life effectively. The mainstay of treatment in diabetic ketoacidosis is IV fluids and IV insulin. And then you need to monitor their electrolytes. Um, just be aware of what you're monitoring the electrolytes for. So in patients with uh, on an in IV insulin infusion, insulin actually drives potassium into the cells. And so these patients are often, uh, well, almost always end up with a low potassium level. So you need to monitor that very closely and um, get, replace the potassium in particular if that's uh, required. And then just don't forget about simple things to do for them as well. Regularly monitor them. And if they have a predisposing cause, i.e. they had an infection, try and reverse that cause. Of course, if it's viral, there's very little you're going to do for them. But if it's bacterial, you might think about antibiotics. So the summary um, slides can be quite busy, by the way, as just a reference point. But when you get your hands on them or when you go back, they should be really helpful. 
Um, and the main thing I want you guys to make sure you've got crystal clear in your mind is you match type one diabetes with DKA. So they go hand in hand. A 17 year old female girl now presents to A&E via ambulance following collapse at her PE school. Uh, at, <laughs> excuse me, following collapse in PE at school. Uh, she felt nauseated, clammy, lightheaded, and she's known to have type one diabetes with regular insulin injections. Her mother mentions she was in a rush this morning as she was late for school. So which of the following diagnoses do you think is the uh, most likely? Fab. So the majority have gone for hypoglycemia and we have um, one going for DKA as well. So let's talk through this. The correct answer is hypoglycemia. Nods to this um, that we talked about. First, we'll talk about why it's hypoglycemia. We'll start there. So this is a young lady who has recently been exercising and she felt nauseated, clammy, and lightheaded in the hours preceding the collapse. So these are all features of a sort of prodrome of feeling um, the effects of a hypoglycemic event. So when you have low blood uh, sugar levels, you can often have these features and patients will often report these features. The fact she was exercising further exacerbates that because the exercise demand increases the demand for glucose. And um, as a consequence, she's already got low levels and now she's got even fewer to meet this demand. She's known to have type one diabetes and she's on insulin. Now the relevance of that in association with the fact that she was in a rush uh, and skipped breakfast is the fact that she may not have adjusted her insulin dose if she's in a position to do that. So obviously insulin is really, well can be really dangerous, but it can also be great. And the point of insulin is to tailor it to your diet so that you can correctly make use of the glucose that's in your system. Now, if she's taken a dose of insulin, i.e. the insulin's working to decrease blood sugar levels, yet she hasn't eaten very much this morning and she's just slept for 12 hours without eating, um, you need to be aware that her blood sugars won't have been very high to start with and then she's taken a dose of insulin. So that's why it's hypoglycemia. So in summary, look out for a sort of prodrome of feeling nauseated, clammy, lightheaded. Look for a trigger, so something like exercising or, or fasting, not eating um, regularly. And then if she's taking her insulin regularly, that might also be related. Now, in response to the idea of DKA, DKA can definitely present with things like nausea, um, lightheadedness, being clammy. Um, and I, I suppose collapse as well and low GCS. Now, the difference with DKA is the fact that this young lady is uh, exacerbated by PE or by exercise and uh, the fact that she hasn't been eating much more strongly points towards hypoglycemia. The other reason that I would probably try and bear in mind is the onset. So she's woken up this morning and within you know a couple of hours, since not eating and being a busy bee, she's now feeling um, the effects. I think DK, you'd probably look for more of a trigger and a predisposing kind of illness that sets them off, at least in an exam question. So you've got this patient in a &E and you assess them uh, and you find them to have hypoglycemia. So their blood glucose is 2.4 um, millimole per liter. She's becoming increasingly drowsy and she's now unable to respond to your questions nor follow your demands. Which of the following is the most appropriate uh, management 
Fab. So this is a good question because we've got a nice mix. So we've got something to talk about, which is great. Now, this is the sort of question that I think is uh, very common to finals. The answer is IV glucose, and I'll, I'll explain my reasoning. So we had an even split between IV glucose and glucagon, uh, and a slightly fewer, slightly fewer people went for buccal glucogel. So this is a really important question, and I'll uh, talk you through my approach to it. Now, when you think about a patient with hypoglycemia, what you're aiming to do is obvious. You're trying to reverse their low blood sugar levels, and you'll do that in whichever way is most fitting. Now, the way to decide what, what's most fitting is to look at their condition. And I see it in four steps, hence the four options. You can have someone who's conscious and able to follow commands, someone who's kind of semi-conscious and not got a safe swallow, someone who's unconscious in the community or needing rapid care, and then someone who's unconscious um, with an unsafe swallow in a medical setting. And that's how I would approach this question. So if someone's conscious and they have a safe swallow and they can follow your commands, they just feel very woozy and you're kind of thinking, you know, they're on their way to becoming more unwell, they can eat and drink something. So if you have someone who can swallow safely, that they can hear what you're saying and follow commands. If you gave them an isotonic sports drink or if you gave them a slice of toast, then um, that would help raise their blood sugar levels, of course. The thing to be aware is just to make sure you're aware of what you've given them and they, whether or not they may require a, a top-up or something else. Buccal glucogel is reserved for patients who are semi-conscious with an unsafe swallow, and you need just a, something kind of rapid and quick, typically in the kind of community or, or uh, where you don't have full resources. And that would involve rubbing effectively glucose onto the gums and it gets absorbed that way. I am glucagon is a very similar concept. I would reserve that for a patient who's unconscious in the community. And you'll often see patients with an glucagon uh, gun, a gun or pen, um, who are on regular insulin therapy and it's their kind of rescue medication. So that would be a setting for that. Now, the reason IV glucose is the most, um, is the best option is because this patient's in a &E, as I mentioned um, when reading the case. So in a &E, you've got full access to resources, 2.4 is fairly low blood sugar, and they're drowsy, unable to respond, and low GCS. So you don't want to take any chances or let this get too much further. And when you have all the resources available, IV glucose would be the way to go. So hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is a life-threatening condition characterized by low blood glucose levels. It's caused by missed or delayed meals, anorexia nervosa, which is the psychological or psychiatric condition in which pa patients minimize their eating and increase their calorie expenditure. Vomiting can cause hypoglycemia, as can excessive insulin use, acute illness or exercise. And as I mentioned in the case, when we talk about insulin, we think about their ability to tailor insulin to their diet. So it presents on a spectrum um, and it depends on the severity of the condition. Of course, initially you might just feel a little bit weak. You might feel hungry or thirsty and you may also experience lightheadedness. A little bit further along the spectrum is there your pins and needles, your flushes and your sort of tremors. And then further again would be palpitations, altered mental state and loss of consciousness. Diagnosis is with low blood glucose levels. The numerical value often varies in literature. Um, I think typically you'd probably say it's about less than four. Some places will be a bit more strict with that, but it should be fairly apparent in a question um, what you're looking at. And management. So I've just summarized the reasoning to the last question. Start with an A2E, um, especially in a patient like that last one, um, because they were drowsy and unwell and they're presenting to A&E. Um, and then we talk through the idea that if they're conscious and safe swallow, give them something orally to eat. If they're conscious with an unsafe swallow, buckle, uh, glucogel. If they're unconscious with minimal resources, um, i.e. it's used as a rescue in the community, use IM glucagon. And if unconscious and it's available, IV glucose.
Fab. So moving on to a second case then. So this is a case of a 54-year-old man who presents to his GP with fatigue and polyuria. Over the four months previously, he's undergone worsening fatigue, uh, weight loss, and he's had a few urinary tract infections which have been treated. He has well-controlled hypertension, NAFLD, and obesity. Uh, and his mother developed diabetes age 48 and his father died of a heart attack age 60. He lives at home with his wife and children, drinks lager regularly with a 25 pack year smoking history and he works as a lorry driver which causes um, difficulty eating a balanced diet due to irregular shift patterns. On review of symptoms you ask if he's noticed anything else going on and he says well he's actually noticed his skin tone appears darker in his armpits and his groins and he actually finds that he stumbles or trips over his feet much more regularly than he ever did. So nice and simply, which of the following is the uh, most likely diagnosis? Think about your types of diabetes and which you think is the most appropriate here. Fab. Okay. So the majority have gone for B, which is type 2 diabetes. Um, and then we also have uh, one or two answers for E, which is LADA. So the answer here is B. So B, this case very nicely kind of summarizes the concept of type 2 diabetes. And it paints a very metabolic picture, uh, metabolic syndrome picture. So you have a patient who's overweight they smoke a lot, they drink a lot, they've got high blood pressure with fatty deposits on their liver um, and they work a job where they're sat behind the wheel a lot and they struggle to exercise and eat a balanced diet. So you want to be thinking about type 2 diabetes. LADA is an interesting condition. It absolutely presents in adulthood. However, it, this doesn't quite paint the same picture. So LADA is effectively a slow burning type 1, as I mentioned. So that'd be a more autoimmune picture. It wouldn't, I don't think you'd have the same risk factors that this patient's demonstrating. Um, but it is a good suggestion. I think fundamentally what, the, what these questions are trying to just emphasize is the concept that in an exam, um, you need to think about common things first. Type 1 and type 2 should be the mainstay. If you have a pregnant lady, it's almost certainly gestational diabetes. It's unlikely you'll see Modi or Lada but they could be in there to throw you off and, and draw your attention away. I think one of my uh, one of my lecturers said, if you hear hoof steps outside, think of a horse, not a zebra. So there you go. So the patient undergoes investigation um, and he's found to have a HbA1c of 68. So the GP then diagnoses type 2 diabetes. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial management plan of this patient? We've got a 50-50, so whoever's casting the final vote gets the say here. Right, thank you. So, as I said, it's very tight. So we've got a, a split between B and C, with C taking Pippin it to the post. Uh, um, so, the correct answer here, again, it's a mean question, is B. Now, in reality, we can talk about the kind of practicality and the reality of these these scenarios um, but for a patient who's newly diagnosed with diabetes the first thing you want to do is to offer lifestyle management offer education on how to improve their lifestyle measures and in this man you also want to offer them a diabetic complication review so that's really important now
in practicality, if you have a gentleman with a HbA1c of nearly 70, I'm sure numerous GPs would opt for metformin first line, but for the purposes of exams, it's really important to have a structured approach. So you start with lifestyle management, give them a bit of time to see what, what they can do and how they can improve their diabetes. You would then, if that's still inadequately controlled, add metformin and so on. So that's why that's the right answer. Now we have a question about HbA1c. So which of the following is not true about HbA1c? But it's also known as glycosylated hemoglobin. It's reflective of blood glucose in the preceding three months. A HbA1c of 42 to 47 represents pre-diabetes. It should not be used in those with hemoglobinopathies or it's a target of 48 should always be used when treating type two. Feel free to take a moment to think about it because it's one of the wordier questions. Cheers, Rowan. I actually just noticed that it, I changed this question. I'll, I'll explain my reasoning. Okay, fantastic. So the vast majority of people went for E with one person going for D and I'll hold my hands up as well. So this question got changed. Um, so the answers that you guys would pick from slightly different. E is the correct answer. Um, a, B, and C are kind of just factual um, pattern recognition things that you should just have in the back of your mind effectively. Now, D, I initially had as should not be used in children. Now, as I said previously, that was always what I had been taught. And then I looked at the guidance and it's actually used regularly in children. And so for clarity, I wanted to pull that out and strip it back to hemoglobinopathies. So that is true. In a patient who has a disease of their kind of red cells or your sickle cells or your hemolytic conditions, HbA1c um, won't give you a good marker of their blood glucose, literally because HbA1c measures how much glucose binds to the hemoglobin molecule. And red cells have a lifespan of about 100 days, hence the three-month period. So in patients with a hemoglobinopathy where their red cells are being broken down, or the hemoglobin isn't um, structurally bindable, then you won't get a good measure of this. Now, no, since so many people picked E, hopefully you know the reasoning behind why this isn't true. It might also be that there's a always in that sentence which packs a bit of a punch effectively. Um, HbA1c is useful in targeting therapy in type two. Now, when you're targeting therapy, there are two numbers that I think you need to have in mind. A target of 48 is ideal and used in patients on medications that do not cause a hypo, meaning a hypoglycemic event. So if someone's on metformin, metformin does not risk hypoglycemia and therefore you'd aim for a, a HbA1c of 48. If it is on medication that can cause a hypoglycemic event, you're aiming for a, a threshold of 53. And that's just so you're not pushing them too low that it might actually make them feel unwell. Type 2 diabetes. So type 2 is a metabolic disorder of glucose regulation. So you initially have insulin resistance and then later the pancreas works over time to make up increased insulin levels thinking that that's the problem uh, and in turn it actually just burns itself out and it leads to beta cell dysfunction. Risk factors include family history, being of South Asian heritage, obesity, smoking, gestational diabetes and PCOS. Um, so polycystic ovarian syndrome. Presentation is often very non-specific, but it can be with, uh, it may be asymptomatic, it could be with polyurea, polydipsia, fatigue, lethargy, weight loss, 
and even features of complications, especially in patients who don't visit their GP regularly or are reluctant to seek medical help. So diagnosis is with a HbA1c of over 48, fasting glucose over seven, and then your random uh, glucose and your oral glucose tolerance tests of over 11.1. In theory, the approach, especially in exam theory, would be if it's a symptomatic patient, a single diagnose, a single measure in one of these categories would diagnose type two diabetes. If they're asymptomatic, you typically aim for two readings, two weeks apart. So that's worth just bearing in mind. Again, in, in kind of practice, you would actually be thinking about how high the level is. I think some doctors from when I've spoken to them would say that if someone's got a HbA1c of 70 or 80, you're probably going to diagnose them anyway. And you might repeat it just to make sure it wasn't a kind of biochemical artifact. But for exam theory, that's what I want you to bear in mind. And then management starts with optimizing lifestyle, as I mentioned. If you optimize their lifestyle and they still can't control their diabetes, you then add metformin. And then if they're on metformin and they're still poorly controlled, you add a second line drug. And we'll talk about a bit of a formulary in a moment. And then just don't forget about annual review, especially in a kind of OSCE station where you can talk about your approach to managing these patients. Um, annual review is really important. This gentleman's tripping over. He may have some sort of neuropathy. And as a consequence, he could be at risk of quite nasty illnesses, which we'll talk about. So bear that in mind. And that HbA1c threshold of 58 is quite a nice number to bear in mind as your kind of time to add an extra therapy in. So if they're 58, if they've got a HbA1c of 58 on medication, add the next thing in. So this is my anti-diabetic formulary. Um, I'm not going to talk through it. It's quite a busy slide and it's more so a resource for you guys to use when you kind of come to revise and write your notes up. I just think it's really important to take a look at the classes, be able to name one or two drugs for each, um, and then think about how it works and any special comments. And the comments are effectively things that might be a bit of a buzzword in an exam and point you in the right direction. There are also memory aids for some of these. Um, I, d I don't remember quite how I used all of them. Sorry, I've got a question. Could you go over how many readings you need to diagnose diabetes? So I assume you mean in type two in particular. Um, so that's what I was saying about it in practice, or at least for exams, if they're symptomatic, one reading should be fine. One reading would, would result in a diagnosis of diabetes. If they're asymptomatic, you need two readings, at least two weeks apart. And if they're both above threshold, then you can diagnose diabetes. Does that make sense? Or did you have something else in mind, Louisa? No problem. So just be aware of your classes, be aware of your named examples and your mechanism. For example, some really key things that jump out from this slide when I take a look. Um, metformin is obviously the first line when we treat someone medically with diabetes. The really important things to think about metformin are actually hidden in that comment box. So the most common side effect and the most common reason people stop taking their metformin is it causes diarrhea. The other things to think about is the risk of lactic acidosis in dehydrated patients. So that's patients who have diarrhea, uh, vomiting, and it's contraindicated in renal disease. And so it, it falls into one of those damn drugs, if that's how you guys remember it, it's how I... So if someone's got renal disease, in particular an AKI, you need to stop the damn drugs. D meaning diuretics, A for ACE inhibitors, M for metformin, and for... Uh, nitrates i think so yeah so that's what you need to be thinking about so dpp4s uh, are associated with pancreatitis your sglt2s are associated with utis and your thiazolidine dions are associated with fluid retentive diseases like heart failure and osteoporosis okay I'll leave that for you guys to come back to. I, I don't think there's very much help in me just talking through it. So thinking about complications, um, it's not something that comes up 
too commonly. Um, I did get asked it in an OSCE one year to talk about the micro versus macro, macro vascular complications. So it's just worth being aware of what we're thinking about. So your microvascular complications include diabetic retinopathy, include diabetic neuropathy, and diabetic nephropathy. And the way you can remember that is they're all your opathies. So retinopathy, obviously a disease of the eyes, is kind of a condition in itself to be aware of. In this context, in this talk, I'm just going to signpost you to think about them as much as anything. So if you have a patient with diabetes and they've got difficulty with their eyesight, the first thing you should probably be thinking about is, do they have diabetic retinopathy? Then you can have diabetic neuropathy. So that might be sensory, which is most common. And that's your glove and stocking distribution of um, anesthesia and parathesia. And as a consequence, you can get um, ulceration and neuropathic deformity of the foot. One example is Charcot's foot. So because they have a lack of sensation in their foot, they can often um, kind of mistreat it, walk unevenly and cause these ulcers that then actually present a risk of infection as well. So they're really important to screen for. You can also have motor problems, the so difficulty initiating movement and autonomic problems, things like uh, postural hypotension, gastrointestinal disturbances and urogenital disturbances as well. And then finally, it's your diabetic nephropathy. So that would be screened for using urine dipstick. Um, if someone has, you know, a urogenital problem, you want to rule that out in the context of diabetes. So then your macrovascular complications are really simply your ischemic heart disease, your peripheral vascular disease, and your cerebrovascular disease. So they're basically the things that we worry about could kill a patient effectively. And it's often a talking point when you're consulting with these patients about the importance of controlling their diabetes. So this same patient who previously had a HbA1c of 68 and is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes now presents to a &E. They've been feeling really unwell with a fever and a cough for seven days and they have now developed abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting and significant thirst. They're now confused and difficult to arouse. What is the most likely diagnosis? Uh, and we, there we go, we got all the answers. So the majority have gone for D, which is hyperglycemic hyperosmolar state. And then we have one or two going for DKA as well. So the answer is D, which is HHS. DKA and HHS, at least in my mind, are very similar conditions. And I'll talk through how to differentiate the two. So HHS is a condition associated with type 2 diabetes. So in this, in similar way to which I emphasize that type 1 links with DKA, try and bunch those together and put them to one side, and then think about type 2 being bunched together with HHS and put those to one side. So this gentleman has type 2 diabetes and he's now got an acute illness. So that automatically starts to make you think about HHS. Now, the difference as well is that in this condition, the kind of onset and the time it takes to feel unwell and the kind of prodrome of the condition is much longer than in DKA. So this man might feel unwell for, set, well, has felt unwell for seven days, but he might feel unwell for 10 or 14 days as well. Whereas in DKA, you're probably looking at a couple of days prodrome, if that, and then they start to feel poorly. He also has very non-specific signs on a background of type two diabetes is abdo pain, nausea, vomiting, and polydips is probably the greatest pointer towards a condition that's linked to his diabetes. His low uh, GCS 
is also quite important. So in summary, you have a gentleman with type 2 diabetes who's acutely unwell and now difficult to rouse and uh, has an altered mental state or at least altered consciousness. And so that would be the reason to jump towards HHS. So as I mentioned, it's linked to type 2 diabetes. It's a caused by a lack of insulin, which is then coupled in a rise in stress hormones, which leads to a profound rise in blood glucose levels. So your cortisol will increase your blood glucose. You don't have enough insulin to manage it uh, appropriately. And so you get these sky high levels. Triggers are very similar to that of DKA. So infection, ischemic heart disease, vomiting and stroke. And as are the presentation. So as I mentioned, the distinction is that this is an older patient with type 2 diabetes and the prodrome lasts a lot longer than DKA. Diagnosis is marked with, uh, is made, sorry, with marked hypoglycemia and raised serum osmolality in the absence of ketonemia. So those ketones are key to the diagnosis of DKA in a patient, whereas you want them absent or at least very low levels in a patient with um, HHS. And the management actually shares a lot of similarity as well. So this is an acutely unwell gentleman. So as always, start with an A2E and IV fluids is the mainstay of treatment. I've put consider insulin therapy because although it might sound logical that his blood sugars are high and so give him insulin not all patients actually require it and it's a medical decision to kind of look at what's in front of you and make that call and similarly you need to monitor and replace their electrolytes it's worth mentioning that in a similar way to the fact that its onset is slower than that of dka your management of this condition will also be a little bit more slow so DK would be a rapid replacement of all these things, whereas HHS, you would slowly replenish them. And then you need to manage them, uh, then you need to monitor them and think about your targets. In all honesty, in an exam, I don't think you're, it's worth remembering these targets unless it's the sort of thing that you pick up really easily. Um, I don't think it will, that you'll be asked to pick a target out ever. However, if you want to keep them in mind, they're, they're there for you. Fab. So that's all my questions, cases and slides. As I said, the slides themselves can be a little bit busy, but I'm hoping to get those out to you. I'm sure peer medics will. Um, and they hopefully will provide a useful resource when revising. If you have any questions, I'm happy to try and tackle them. Um, otherwise, thanks for your time, especially on Saturday morning uh, and have a great weekend. Thanks very much. No worries, mate. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Hi. Um, can everyone fill out the feedback for Michael um, and just put your email down if you require the um, teaching slides as well and we'll send those out. Um, I've put the link within the chat, so it's just right at the top. So that'd be great. All right. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.